And you talked about a journey, a play is a journey through time and space. Mm -hmm. Time I can relate to, this happens and then this moves to this and then moves or back and forth mm -hmm. in time. A journey through space, because you said the space between the actors. But do you actually mean no, the I physical meant, space? No, I meant the really more the space of the story. And the way to my mind, there's always... The, f the literal face? The, uh, I well, mean, take uh, forests. It goes uh, from a, 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 an old folks home on the north shore of... of Quebec, and then it goes to Toronto, and then it goes to France, and then it goes. Do you mean those kind of spaces? I mean, there's 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 the space of the story, like that as you described. There's spaces that it moves through, and there's a, it, there is a story of spaces that goes on from going from an old folks' home to Quebec to, and that play deeper into the forest, deeper into the place where the secrets are revealed in terms of an investigation. And there are two times and spaces. There are the two investigators. And then there's the, 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 the past that's being unveiled or happening simultaneously, if you like, that they're trying to reach towards. And we're seeing the past, and they're l looking into the past, and we see the difference between the two in that particular instance. But there's also uh, the space. There's a, the other time and space is the time in the theater and the space of the theater. And that, too, must go through an evolution in sync, in parallel, uh, in in time with the mm, uh, with the actual story, but you're dealing with the the real needs and the real problems of being in the Tarragon Theater in the main space, doing a big story like that. How do you do that big story with a pretty epic sort of size and change in many locations with not much space to do that in? How do you create that huge size scale, scope? The time of the theater, the place starts at 8 o'clock, and it's down at 10 o'clock or 10.30, so watching that time go through at the time of the performance experience. And if you remember, actually, in Forest, where there was one Sunday, you went out the side door in preview week, and the light came rushing in on a beautiful sunny day, and suddenly the whole space in the theater became light after this very sort of gloomy and doomy play. <laughs> and, uh, and I went, what a breath of fresh air to have this happen. And then that night, I think on Sunday, we decided to try and open up all the doors in the theater. And then we realized, of course, the train would come by and ruin uh, Vivian's final speech, her eulogy to her mother, which would just step on and ruin it. So those are real, th that's a real s scenario in the theater. A train will come by and destroy that speech. We can't do that, even though it lets all this fresh air into the theater. Uh, and light, or, or just even fresh air, just the wave of fresh air. It just seemed so wonderful when that happened that day. A and yet we couldn't go further than that. Couldn't go and open that side door and close it and, um, and get a, a glimmer of what a fresh air might be to these people. So how does Richard Rose then, as you're heading into thinking about doing forests, and you have a play, just for us, you have a play that at least spans a century. It goes back and forth in time. It goes back and forth between two continents within a century all over the place. So you have that movement in space, and then you have the Tarragon Theater. So when Richard sits down with the designer or his thoughts, how do you begin that journey of, how do I make those two spaces start to ring together? A lot of my or er early work was in dance, in modern dance. I was a lighting designer. And I was very uh, drawn to dancers uh, creating imagery and creating story or whatever in an empty space with their body and their gesture and and their movement and the choreography and that there was nothing really I mean basically most dance pieces big wide open space mm -hmm. back wall image on the back wall maybe or not um, lighting that changes and that uh, in this empty space something could happen that would evoke the time and space and I have it tended to be drawn to that time and time again. It, be, it really, be, say it's more my aesthetic. I have tended to do move, you know, not do as many naturalistic plays, if you like, because I have not been interested I, in those kind of plays with four walls and or three walls and two doors and um, a fireplace or a kitchen. I have done, but uh, it not it, it intrigued my imagination or expressed the dimensionality that I want a story to go in or the stories I like. Uh, so I actually try and find something. And if I can find the one thing, the one element um, that can evolve 
as that story evolves and tell that story, tell on one level that we're in a dining room, that we're in a hospital, that we're in a, um, uh, in a forest, uh, that we're in um, a dining room in the forest, in a home in the forest, that we're in a pit, that we're, if I can find that one element or space that can be used in the one way that can evolve through those elements, so we see the space transform. And in a, se in a sense to me, it's like seeing the metaphor of the space transform that's part of the act of telling the story. Hopefully, fingers crossed, that that element reflects the action of the play. Right. And you can't ask me what forced the action of the play. I was because it's too many years ago that I did it. But I do. Um, it was a search. You. It was a search. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, there was a detective story they were searching yeah. for. But th there was also this. There was a, an attempt to reconcile abandonment, I think, right? Yeah. The, the fact that people were abandoned. The and key this phrase story, was, I will never abandon, abandon you. you. So what does that mean to be uh, abandoned? And why did the, the, the child who's abandoned search for the parent, right? The missing parent, the lost parent. What are they seeking, right? What knowledge are they seeking? What information is they need? Um, so we, and there was a central image, a very, very important image in the forest where there was a pit. And so we took, dropped the stage down to its base level in the theater, as low as it's ever been in my time period here, where it was like looking down into a pit, less like a prospect but looking down, and tried to at least evoke that perceptual feeling on the part of the audience that they were looking down all the time, even though they weren't in a pit all the time, they were in a dining room, they were in a hospital, they were. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with very simple elements, move as the investigators move through the story, digging into the past or looking in the past, and watching two time periods, the present investigators and the past side by side. Um, um, uh, in a sense, <laughs> I think the interesting thing about all investigations is, uh, and as I think was we found in Arcadia, you can look for the, the, the meaning of anything if you just look into your own lives. If you want to look at what the past is really about, we'll look at desire in the 20th century, and you might discover what desire might have been during Arcadia. Um, it could be sexual desire, it could be knowledge, it could be the great mathematical equation. Um, or in Forest, these, this t sense of the past and the present being very close to each other, nearly touching each other, and uh, in looking for the past, sometimes you just have to look this way as how you might behave. And so I think that's part of the discovery of people um, in the play, uh, Duke Pontel and the young girl, that uh, it's really uh, their desire to connect with their parents is as much, uh, or her desire to connect with her parents, mm -hmm. her, her, her deep history, where she came from, uh, how she came to be, is what they were trying to do. And, uh, then how do you take that with your designer then? Does, does the designer go, say, oh, I'm working with Richard. Okay, he's going to want nothing on stage, and I'm going to ask to do a bed and maybe a door frame. Uh, mm -hmm. That's Richard. Uh, that's, you know. that's pretty much me, yeah. That's yep. pretty so, much and, I, and I try and even reduce the element. And one so of the you're elements a reductionist, of like strip away everything that you don't need till you have the essentials, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because I really think in the end that half the performance and half the production happens in the audience's imagination. And so if you give them too much, and it's very difficult to do a play like Forest in nothing but a bear set because of its nature and it evol evolving from so many different locations, is uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, is you, you, mu you must reduce it, and I always do. I always strip away, strip away. I just recently did a play about Vermeer. And the designer wanted to put up a wall and doors and a window. To and I said, I want to evoke a Vermeer painting all the time. And I just said, no, just get strip it away, strip it away. I just want a canvas. Not because Tarragon has a small budget. Not in, because uh, Tarragon has a budget. I want a canvas. <laughs> I want a canvas floor. I want the actors to o operate within six feet. So that's an, like that. There's an example of a very good example of space. I said, you're right, going to be right up against the wall. It's going to be very pictorial. The blocking will be very pictorial. There will be, there'll be movement, but it's really pictorial. You'll very rarely get away from the wall. Uh, you'll, ne you'll rarely get downstairs. You have to, of course, because the needs of the play, the needs of the story. But I, I kept it pretty close. The lighting was lit that way. And there was, in the end, one door that was just sort of off stage. And you saw it open. It brought on light, and it took away light. It, it, 
uh, all the lighting was very Vermeer-like, if you like. Uh, the door accented it from a different direction, not from a window, but from a door. And then suddenly the door in the process of the rehearsal became this major metaphor, which I changed everything about in production week because I realized when we got the door and started working on production week, I said, well, the door tells us we're in prison. Mm -hmm. And the closing the door and the latching the door became everything. And then I started to just alter the blocking, the desperation being let into th through the door. Uh, and then the door latching behind him, start starting the play. And then he keeps trying to get out of the door, get out of the door. He's finally released, and the door is uh, you know, open for him to go, but he doesn't want to go, and he eventually dies in his, his, in his jail, jail cell. Um, and it became a recurring metaphor that I just kept employing over and over again, mm, you know, pursuing his warden at, to the door and almost getting out, and then trapping her at the door, and, in a sense keeping her in the room, so their Stockholm Syndrome type of relationship became all about the door and the story of the door. So. And this was in the week before you opened? This is in pre production week, preview week, yeah. I went, oh, it's the story of the door, isn't it? Anyway. And the light. I mean, that was a whole... The, the so what would you do, Richard, if Matthew Jocelyn said, okay, I want you to direct next year, and I want you to direct, I don't know, Edward Bond's The Sea, yeah. and uh, I have $400,000 for the set, and you've got to use it. Mm -hmm. I need a $400,000 set. My audience wants to see a set. Yeah. What would you spend the money on? Effects. <laughs> <laughs> Special effects. Well, I, I think we, and I have done huge shows like, you know, like that, spent lots of money in operas and stuff. Like I'm still looking for an evolving metaphor of the space um, uh, and how the space is used given the nature of the show. So, I don't know, you fly people in, you, you know, if that's pertinent to the show, uh, you might have... Uh, uh, um, but again, sets do not interest, set pieces, rolling on, rolling off, you know, seeing well, the walls. I have done. No, no, that's, that's not the... No, it only interests me if it serves the action of the story. So when I did uh, Not Wanted the Voyage at uh, Canadian Stage and MTC in the big houses, uh, it was an arc. Mm -hmm. And the arc was beh hidden behind something. And they kind of went through a scrim into the play, and then there was this kind of empty space, a field, the, the farm field. Uh, and then the rain starts to come, and uh, the walls open. Or I think that's what happened. The walls open. Maybe it's just the arc came forward out of the shadow, and an arc pushed on stage. And this kind of classic image of Noah's Ark pushed on stage, and they went into the ark uh, down below, and they came up above, and then way up high in the proscenium arch. So I was using the proscenium arch as a whole picture, but it was a giant arc. And then the arc uh, uh, in Act Two opened up. And you saw inside the ark. And then you saw this kind of doll's house effect of the whole world being inside the ark. So suddenly they were very limited in terms of their space. That was very, mm, um, in a way, oddly enough, naturalistic. But uh, what I was trying to do was move from the sense of a, this empty world that Noah's world was down to everybody being constrained and the world being carried along um, in this way. Um, and this kind of doll's house effect of the, the whole world, all the animals, all the human beings, and them struggling to rebuild society and civilization again. Now, when yeah. you develop these points of view, I won't call them ideas, yeah. these points of view, is that in the rehearsal period? Is that with a designer ahead of time? Is this always flux and flow, or what? Um, it, 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 sometimes it's a bit ahead of time. Um, I'm currently working on a show, and I have a really difficult proposition in the show because the actor, the writer's got this bedroom happening on the second floor. It's in a bed. It's uh, in the Ukraine. looks like a real bedroom. He's littling the bedroom. He opens these shutters, and he opens himself onto a Fantasia garden, this kind of un unreal world right. in the garden. And he's give, been given a key by accident or by manipulation, actually. And he opens a window and looks down on the garden. Well, it's very hard to act anybody above downstage, center, center, right? In terms of that's what people up there, it's really hard to see them. It's hard to do scenes in up the there. tarragon. In the tarragon, right? It's but right. And I just I think I've come up with a solution, right? Which is this guy opening these shutters and there should be a wall and the shutter the, sh the whole space should open up into the garden. So they're actually on the same floor. And then when we do the scenes where he's in the window and, and uh, the family down below is down below, which are smaller scenes if you like, he climbs down at the garden and joins falls in love with this young lady in the garden. 
um, it makes those the people in the window the big thing, but it makes a whole set a window. And in a sense, the, what the action is, is the journey of a young man discovering what the Ukraine is. He's a Canadian, Ukrainian Canadian as part of the diaspora going back to monitor the Orange Revolution. And he has very romantic notions and naive notions of an orange Ukraine. Uh, and it's put the, the election right after the Orange Revolution. Of course, we've seen the consequences of that today. 